Hi guys. I know it doesn't look like it probably in the background, but it is actually a spectacularly gorgeous day. Gorgeous day here in the end times. On uh, what day in the end times is it? It is Sunday morning at about 7 o'clock on Sunday morning, September 10th, 2017. Here in the former paradise of the Olympic Peninsula. The Olympic Peninsula. No place for a depressed collapsitarian. It is, this is somewhere between a slaughterhouse and a graveyard. It is one of the most butchered, profaned, shat upon and just basically fucked up by goddamn clueless fucking moron planet eating humans that I have ever experienced in my entire life. I'm sitting somewhere, God knows where, in the Olympic National Forest squeezed up between a volcano and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, th this is a national forest if you've heard the title Silent Spring, this is some basically some sort of third growth cornfield that I'm uh, camping in where not one indication that there is one living creature anywhere around. I mean, total, complete silence. Uh, so anyway, I can't think of a better place to bring you this week's Doomsday Sermon, where I just open my latest favorite Bible of the Apocalypse to uh, just for more examples of how humans just need to go. Humans just just need just need to go. And again, guys, I have no idea how much life is left on these batteries. So if, uh, if it shuts off in the middle, there's nothing I can do about it. So I better get on into it. This is by this fellow. I've never uh, read a sermon from him by, uh, I think he's, uh, what is his name? Is Dr. Stephen J. Gould. He might recognize the name. I know he's... Uh, professor at, at Harvard. Um, I think he's a paleobiologist. I'm not at all sure, but anyway, uh, Brother Stephen has many books out, and this is a collection of his essays called Eight Little Piggies. Eight Little Piggies, which I was thinking about reading the title essay. But I'm going to go through the, the, the first chapter, the first group of essays, is simply called Extinction. And what I'm going to center on is the extinction of two of these species. You know, you keep hearing about that 200 species are going extinct every day. Well, 99.9% .9 of those are these little bitty invertebrates things without backbones that you have never heard of. And so we're going to zero in on a couple of those with some stories about things you have heard about, such as Galapagos tortoises and passenger pigeons. But we're going to start out, in the, uh, out on the island of Bally High. If you've, uh, is it Bali or Bally High? Uh, off the coast of Tahiti, the real name of this island is Morea, but most of us know it at Bally High. And we're going to talk about the uh, obliteration off the face of this planet from this little snail called Partula. Partula, which has probably been there for, who knows, millions of years. And even when the Polynesians moved in... Uh, they, there was nothing there that humans really needed. Well, they, they used the, the, the shells for jewelry a little bit. But so for thousands and thousands of years, with the Polynesians coexisted in paradise on Bali High with these little, with these little snails. 
uh, these completely innocent little snails going about their business for millions of years until Honky got there uh, and then all hell broke loose. And it didn't even break loose till about 50 years ago. Okay, so we're just going to dive right in and this is talking about in, uh, invasive species. Invasive species. Anyone who does not understand why invasive species are one of the biggest threats to the planet. Of course, the number one invasive species, bar none, would be Homo sapiens, the most rapacious, bloodthirsty, uh, ecocidal invasive species on the planet, bar none. But we're going to talk about, uh, <clears throat> about this story. All right. Add snails to the litany about the best laid plans of mice and men. Great expectations die quickly on the bonfires of human vanity. We are only a, this was written in uh, the early 90s, this essay. We are only a decade from the brave words of 1980, but Morea is no longer a laboratory for studying active speciation in Partula. It has become a mausoleum. Think of all the metaphors you know for how little things made worse by attempted solutions that cascade into even greater problems, for you need this apparatus to grasp the extirpation of Partula on Morea. Think of Pandora's box. Think of the old woman who swallowed a, f a fly in the folk song. <clears throat> Partula eats fungi growing upon dead vegetation and therefore poses no threat whatsoever to agriculture. Its only and slight impact upon the native economy is entirely positive, as women string the shells together to make lays for the tourist trade. But animals introduced onto isolated islands often wreak havoc, both with native organisms and with agriculture. Witness the rabbits of Australia and sight the most dangerous creature of all, the human, the human, who wiped out so many species of, for instance, moas on New Zealand. An introduced snail began the sad chain of destruction on Morea. This is snail upon snail upon snail. In sharp contrast with the benign Partula, African tree snails of the genus Akatina are in almost all cases unmitigated disasters. First of all, they are gigantic as snails go. Second, they are voracious herbivores of living plants, including many agriculturally important species. With their clear record of destruction on island after island, I am amazed that people still introduce them purposefully. They are brought in for food <clears throat> for I'm told that they are succulent, and you do get a lot of meat per snail. Akatina was first imported to the Indo-Pacific Rim in, eight, in 1803 by the governor of Reunion Island who brought them from Madagascar so that his lady friend could continue to enjoy her snail soup. They escaped from his garden and devastated the entire island. By 1847, they had reached India. In the 1930s, they began to spread into the South Pacific Islands, and usually by purposeful introduction for food. <clears throat> 
Akatina reached Tahiti in 1967 and soon spread to neighboring islands. By the mid-1970s, the infestation had become particularly serious on Maria. <clears throat> the snails even invaded human dwellings. One report tells of a farmer who removed two wheelbarrow loads of Akatina from the walls of his house. Admittedly, something had to be done. And take a wild guess what they did. The attempted solution, like the old lady ingesting the horse to catch the fly, she had originally swallowed, created greater havoc than the original problem trying, they were trying to solve. <clears throat> Biological control is a good idea in principle. Better a natural predator than a chemical poison, but predators particularly when introduced from alien places and ecosystems, may, may engender greater problems than the creature that, in, that inspired their introduction. How can you know that the new predator will eat only your problem animal? Suppose it prefers other creatures that are benign or even useful. Suppose in particular that it attacks endemic species, often so vulnerable for lack of evolved defenses in the absence of native predators. Biological control therefore should be attempted only with the utmost caution. But, speaking of folk songs and citing a more recent composition than the old lady and the fly, when will they ever learn? In my personal pantheon of animals to hate and fear, no creature ranks higher than Euglendina, the killer or cannibal snail of Florida. Euglandia eats other snails with utmost efficiency and voraciousness. It senses their slime trails, locks onto them, and follows the path to a quarry, then quickly devours it. Euglandia has therefore developed a worldwide reputation as a potential agent of biological control for other snails. Yet, despite a few equivocal successes, most attempts have failed, often with disastrous and unintended side effects, as Euglandia leaves the intended enemy alone and turns its attention to a harmless victim. Wow. So, Euglandia, the cannibal snail, was introduced to Morea on March 16, 1977 with the official advice and approval of the Rural Economic Service and the D Division of Agronomic Research, despite easily available knowledge of its failures and devastation elsewhere. Euglandina ignored Akatina, the bad snail, and began a blitzkrieg against Partula, this completely innocent little native snail. More thorough, rapid, and efficient than anything that Hitler's armies ever accomplished. When my colleagues wrote their first article about this disaster in 1984, this is, what, seven years 
from the time the first one of these cannibal snails had ever been released on the island, Euglandia had already wiped out one of these seven Partula species on Morea and was spreading across the island at a rate of 1.2 kilometers per year. Well, Maria is only 12 kilometers across, and you quickly run out of island at that rate. My colleagues made the grim prediction that Partula would be completely gone by 1986. One hates to be right about certain things. In 1998, my colleagues published another note with a brief and final title, The Extinction of Partula on Murea. Partula is gone. Oh. So, as he was writing in 1990, hope, hope remains in Pandora's box that they're going to be able to reintroduce them from these little private collections in zoos with these tiny little populations of Partula being kept alive in zoos. But the question is, how do you re-enclose the bad guys? Mor Morea may be the Bali High of our dreams, but life for Partula has become an unenchanted evening. Now, night has fallen. The story would be sad enough if only Morea and Bermuda and how many other islands had fallen victim. But Euglandia is now spreading just as rapidly on the larger adjacent Tahiti, and Partula now survives in only two valleys there, and this was 27 years ago. The even more diverse Akanella is gone, or nearly so, on Oahu, largely for the same reason, although the spread of Honolulu hasn't helped either. More than half the species are extinct on the Galapagos Islands. It is so hard for an evolutionary biologist such as myself to write about extinctions caused by human stupidity. Emotions well up and extinguish rationality in writing. What can be said that hasn't been stated before with great eloquence and little effect. Even the good arguments have now become cliches, as corny as Kansas in August, as normal as blueberry pie. I appreciate that we cannot win this battle to save species and environments without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well. For we will not fight to save what we do not love. So let them all continue the films, the books, the television programs, the zoos, the little half acres of ecological preserves in any community, the primary school lessons, the museum demonstrations, even though you will never find me there, the 6 a.m. bird walks. Let them continue and expand because we must have visceral contact in order to love. We really must make room for nature. The Georgia Guidestones would say leave room for nature in our hearts. Consider one last image of Azio Pinza as Emil D. Beck in South Pacific and accept the traditional characterization of nature as female. The words may be banal, and Pinza was only extolling Mary Martin while I speak of all nature. 
but the emotional setting is incomparable and still can bring tears to any unjaded eye. Think of this greatest of bassos as he soars up to the tonic of his cord. Once you have found her, never let her go. Once you have found her, never let her go. And then we're going to go from land snails to limpets in uh, his essay, Losing a Limpet. And actually, I'm not quite sure why he did this. He actually chose the extinction of this little uh, marine snail, the, the species of limpet up there in Canada, which unbelievably was not caused by humans. Although my guess is if uh, he had dug a little bit deeper into the onion, he probably would have found that on one level it most certainly was. And, uh, but before he gets into this very detailed discussion of how this limpet went extinct with or without help from uh, humans, he talks about uh, Galapagos tortoises and passenger pigeons to lead in to his discussion. So we're going to talk about uh, tortoises and pigeons. <clears throat> Charles Darwin marveled at the abundance of giant Galapagos tortoises when he visited the islands in September 1835 but he also noted a marked decline even then based on the ease of human exploitation for food. Ships would often take tortoises away by the hundreds, stacking them live in the hold to provide months of fresh meat on the hoof. The tortoises were essentially defenseless. As a single barrier to capture, Darwin notes that ships usually sent out hunting parties in pairs, and two men could not lift the largest animals. Darwin wrote in The Voyage of the Beagle, Quote, it is said that formerly single vessels have taken away as many as 700 of these animals and that the, sh and that the ship's company of a frigate some years since brought down 200 to the beach in one day. Getting back to, uh, to Brother uh, <clears throat> Stephen. The species, though not threatened as a whole, is much depleted today in several distinctive subspecies once limited to single islands have disappeared. I saw the saddest story of this legacy, Lonesome George, the last survivor of the saddle-backed tortoise race from Pinta Island. No mate has been found for George, though the island has been scoured. He has been moved for safekeeping and in apparently vain hope for salvation of his kind to a research station on Santa Cruz Island where I saw him several years ago. He is well fed and surely pampered, and he may live for another century or more, but his lineage, at least as a pure pedigree, is already extinct. I think I remember just reading a couple of years ago that Lonesome George is now dead. I'm pretty sure I remember reading that. From tortoises to pigeons. <clears throat> Every George must have his Martha. The last passenger pigeon, 
Also, a mateless vestige of a doomed race died in the Cincinnati Zoo on September 1st, 1914. Martha's body was taken to the Cincinnati Ice Company, suspended in a tank of water, frozen into a 300-pound block of ice, and sent for extrication and stuffing to the Smithsonian Institution, where she resides today. And I think that some people are, are, are hoping to revive the passenger pigeon from the DNA in Martha's little toe. Anyway, <clears throat> Galapagos tortoises were vulnerable and restricted in geography. Their extreme reduction and partial extinction merits no special surprise. But how could the superabundant and widespread passenger pigeon crash and die within a century? By some estimates, they were once the most common bird in America. They migrated in huge flocks over most of eastern and central North America. Pioneer ornithologist Alexander Wilson estimated one colony in Wisconsin. Est I'm sorry, pioneer ornithologist Alexander Wilson estimated one such aggregation as containing more than two billion of the birds. One colony in Wisconsin spread out over 750 square miles. The famous testimony of Audubon himself made in Ohio just 100 years before Martha's death not only identified human rapacity as the cause of decline, but also depicts the fabulous... Abundance. So we're going to hit now here a long passage from good old James Audubon himself. Quote, As the time of the arrival of the passenger pigeons approached, their foes, meaning humans, anxiously prepared to receive them. Some people were ready with iron pots containing sulfur, others with torches of pine knots. Many had poles, and the rest, guns. Everything was ready, and I, all eyes were fixed on the clear sky that could be glimpsed amid the tall treetops. Suddenly, a general cry burst forth, Here they come! The noise they made, even though still distant, reminded me of a hard gale at sea passing through the rigging of a close-reefed vessel. <coughs> the birds arrived and passed over me. I felt a current of air that surprised me. Thousands of the pigeons were soon knocked down by the pole men, while most continued to pour in. The fires were lighted, and a magnificent, wonderful, terrifying sight presented itself. The pigeons, arriving by the thousands, alighted everywhere, one above another, until solid masses were formed on the branches all around. Here and there, the perches gave way with a crack under the weight and fell to the ground, destroying hundreds of birds beneath. The, scent, the scene was one of uproar and confusion. Even the gun reports were seldom heard in the noise, and I was made aware of the firing only by seeing the shooters reloading. The picking up of the dead and wounded birds was put off till morning. The pigeons were constantly coming in, and it was past midnight before I noticed any decrease in the number of those arriving. The uproar continued the whole night. Towards the approach of day, the noise somewhat subsided. 
long before I could distinguish them plainly, the pigeons began to move off. By sunrise, all that were able to fly had disappeared. Eagles and hawks, accompanied by a crowd of vultures, took their place and enjoyed their share of the spoils. Then the author of all of this devastation, otherwise talking about humans, the author of all this devastation began to move among the dead, the dying, and the mangled, picking up the pigeons and piling them in heaps. When each man had as many pigeons as he could possibly dispose of, hogs were let loose to feed on the remainder. Jesus. Getting back to uh, Brother Stephen. In 1805, passenger pigeons sold for a penny apiece in the markets of New York City. By 1870, the birds were reproducing only in the Great Lakes region. Hunters used the newly invented telegraph to inform others about the location of dwindling populations. Perhaps the last large wild flock ever, some 250,000 birds, was sighted in 1896. A gaggle of hunters alerted by telegraph converged upon them. Fewer than 10,000 from the original 250,000 birds flew away. 240,000 of the 250,000 slaughtered in one day. The last wild, wild passenger pigeon was killed in Ohio in 1900. The few zoo colonies dwindled as keepers could never induce the birds to breed regularly. By 1914, only Martha remained. These sad, oft-told tales are canonical stories of the extinction saga. Defenseless populations composed of individuals that are easy to find and profitable to kill. Restricted range on an island is the surest path to destruction the dodo or tortoise model, but even a huge continental spread will not save a vulnerable population, the passenger pigeon model and almost the bison model. One environment, however, has been seen as a refuge for at least most kinds of organisms, the open ocean. Here, or so the argument goes, geographic ranges are usually large enough and ecological tolerances sufficiently broad to prevent rapacious humanity from getting every last one of them. Populations may be beaten back, but a few survivors will always find a refuge. And anyway, I don't have my bullshit uh, detector button. Uh, then he talks about this uh, evolutionary biologist Lamarck, uh, who did not, uh, who did not believe that animals could go extinct. <clears throat> But even Lamarckian response cannot be quick or extensive enough to overcome the most powerful and efficiency agency of environmental disturbance, human depredation, uh, where, where even Lamarck uh, has to draw a little, uh, a little footnote 
that there is one way animals can go extinct, but he was claiming that you would never see an extinction of an animal in the oceans. <clears throat> we, we would downplay Lamarck's optimism about the oceans today, yes, I bet. Uh, conspicuous species of large, large animals with small populations are vulnerable, and several fish and marine mammals, including the stellar sea cow, have succumbed. There you go. Extinction has certainly received its fair share of attention in our newspapers and TV specials. We are so used to tales of destruction, so inured or even numbed to them, that we expect almost any species anywhere in the world to be the next victim. We have engraved the notion of fragility upon our souls. And then he gets into the long, complicated, sad tale of this little limpet named Latia. And I'm just going to get to the very last paragraph. So even though Latia, according to Gould, cannot be the extinction of Latia cannot directly be laid at the hand of humans. <clears throat> Latia does bear a symbolic message for the anthropogenic theme of extinction, however. As the first species to die during historic times in the one habitat that from the from Lamarck to 1991 seemed free of such danger. Latia must stand as a warning and an emblem, as the crispus attics of a potential wave in the most protected arena if our environmental assaults worsen. Didn't British power laugh at the ragtag rebellion when Crispus Attucks and four others died in the Boston Massacre of 1770? Most crises start with something small, something virtually beneath our notice, but whispers soon grow to whirlwinds. Limpets with their low profiles and large apertures often serving as suction cups for attachment are metaphors for tenaciousness, for hunkering down, for hunkering down in times of trouble. How appropriate then as a warning against complacency that a real version of this symbol should be the first species to die in a realm of supposed invulnerability. Amen. Brother Stephen J. Gould. And with that, I am going to wrap up today's Doomsday Sermon and get back to the rudderless, anchorless, pointless existence of my life of swimming around in this fishbowl, deciding whether I'm going to stick around here uh, in, in this scene of wanton destruction known as the former paradise of the Olympic Peninsula or whether I'm going to find out whether the smoke has cleared from the Cascades. I'm hoping this little rain front moved through last night and if the smoke has cleared, I'm going to pack it up and head back to North Bumblefuck, uh, because this, guys, the Olympic Peninsula, it, it's, it's fucked. So we will see where this day takes me. 
in my gas-sucking truck for this doomsday sermon. Bye, guys.